This video is brought to you by Magic Spoon. As a kid, my favorite part of mornings was watching cartoons, playing video games, and eating cereal. Now, as a grown adult, my favorite part of mornings is watching cartoons, playing video games, and eating cereal. But the cereal part is harder to do as an adult who is also trying to eat healthy. That's where Magic Spoon comes in, providing great tasting cereal that's also way more nutritious. Zero grams of sugar, 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving at only 140 calories. There are several flavors to choose from, cocoa, peanut butter, frosted, and fruity, plus even more available like cookies and cream, maple waffle, cinnamon, and blueberry. I haven't had cereal for breakfast in about a decade because I do try to eat healthy, and Magic Spoon cereal tastes way better than any healthy thing should have the right to. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, wheat-free, soy-free, and it's low carbs makes it fit into anyone's diet. Plus, the back of the box still has those mazes you can do. Go to magicspoon.com slash projared or use promo code projared at checkout to get $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon has a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you get it and you don't like it for any reason, you can get a refund, no questions asked. Once again, use the link in the description below or use code PROJARED to get $5 off today. And we can all feel a little bit less guilty by eating cereal for adults while we watch cartoons for children. I've been rewatching Gargoyles. Everyone, I have done it. I have discovered the weirdest version of SimCity. One so weird, you never knew it existed. And whatever one it is that you are currently thinking it is, you're wrong. Which says a lot, because it turns out there are a lot of ports of SimCity. I grew up playing a lot of SimCity in my youth. While SimCity 2000 is arguably the best one, and the less said about the 2013 installment, the better. It was the SNES original that captivated me the most. Even at only six years old, or whatever age I was, I got enthralled by residential zones, managing housing costs, reducing crime, and dealing with traffic jams. More than anything, I thought getting the R-top and C-top mega buildings was the coolest thing you could do, before activating every single disaster at the same time, at least. The Super Nintendo game actually ended up being the most popular version of the original SimCity, having sold over 2 million copies compared to the few hundred thousand of its computer brethren. In my limited worldview as a kid, my ignorance led me to believe that the SNES game that I also adored was the original, and it turns out it's not even close. While that version came out in 1991, SimCity was first released in the 80s. The Amiga was home to a port of SimCity, and is quite similar to the Super Nintendo version most of us are familiar with. The only major differences here is that residential zones are green instead of red. It goes without saying that the lack of music is jarring, and the sound effects aren't exactly up to par with the console. But this isn't the weirdest version of SimCity. The ZX Spectrum also got SimCity. Slightly less color palettes available makes your city built all over blindingly yellow landscape. All the same features are here, and still works quite well despite the slower game speed. Much like the Amiga version, there's no music, and the sound effects rarely make an appearance. Most interesting I've found is that this doesn't have the monster attack disaster, instead allowing for manually triggering a nuclear meltdown, something that is saved for scenarios or extremely rare occurrences in other versions. But this isn't the weirdest version of SimCity. The most surprising one I found was that the Macintosh got its own SimCity around the same time as the Amiga and ZX Spectrum, around 1989 and a couple of years before the Super Nintendo. Obviously, it's all black and white, so not exactly the most visually appealing. At least the building graphics kind of match what I'm used to. It also lacks sound effects or music, but it still has everything included, right down to monster attacks. But this isn't the weirdest version of SimCity. The most surprising of all ports was that the original 8-bit Nintendo Entertainment System was to get its own SimCity. It was shown at trade shows in 1991, but quietly canceled in favor of its 16-bit brother. An unreleased prototype was discovered, and its ROM made available online. I cannot believe this thing exists. This is such a cool discovery and keeps the history of video game conservation alive. While absolutely surprising, no, this is not the weirdest version of SimCity. The original, the very first SimCity, was developed for the Commodore 64. 
While it was made and finished in 1984, it wasn't released until 1989. The limitations here are pretty obvious. Graphics, sound, the fact that you can't even see what your population is at. One thing that this has that none of the others do is pipelines and making sure water is provided to all of your buildings. And even though this is the original, in all its primitive glory, this is not the weirdest version of SimCity. SimCity was ported to well over a dozen different platforms and operating systems and who knows what else. But one form I never thought I would ever see it in is this. SimCity The Trading Card Game was published by Mayfair Games and released in 1994. A starter deck comes with 60 random cards and an instruction manual. There is so much to unpack here on these cards. First of all, there is no artwork. Instead, it's all very real photos of very real locations from around Niles, Illinois. And you can clearly see that they had to stretch the imagination a bit to make some of these buildings work. Some multi-story complex? Sure, that's a ski manufacturer. I have a lot of questions about Primitive Hut. This is just a YMCA. And I want to know in what world does this look like a nightclub to anyone? There are numerous ways to play. Everyone sharing one deck building one city, everyone having their own deck, everyone building their own city competitively, or as many players as you want. Building is done in phases, as denoted by the color of the bar the stat block is in. You must start with small settlement cards, consisting of things like landscape, some farms, or that one local weirdo trying to live off the grid. After enough population has grown, you can then build village cards, then city cards, and finally metropolis cards. Rather than spending money to build things, each zone is worth so many dollars and the first one to whatever dollar amount wins. Cards also show how much population they provide, require, how much crime it has, and how much pollution it contributes. The physical space of the table also matters, because you can only play cards where there is space available, and where they end up affects the score. So it's generally better to play on a standard kitchen table than, say, the food tray on the back of an airplane seat. With a starting hand of seven, you begin your turn by drawing a card, playing one card on the table, and that's it. That's as involved as it gets. After the first card, all additional cards must be played next to it. Also important is that every card has transportation along its borders. Roads, railways, and some of them even power lines. Connecting these together to form a contiguous transport line is necessary for cards that require a certain population to reach it. This is as complex as a decision gets. Where to place it for the road and rails to line up. Otherwise, you can get a bonus for putting similar zones next to each other, like commercial all grouped up, or farms, or whatever. After reaching phase 3, the city phase, it really gets spicy. Now you can rezone and rebuild cards already played, but can only do so if the newly elected city council votes in agreement. Whoever initiated the city phase automatically receives the mayor card. My 60 card starter deck didn't have one of these, so as stated by the instruction manual, I can use the one inside the manual itself, which means I am now this guy. When it comes to voting, the mayor gets two votes and breaks ties. For other players to get votes, they need to purchase city council members. Paying for their services may reduce their score, but at least now they get to vote on important zoning decisions. This guy is agriculture, this lady is governmental, and cell phone guy is my new hero. There are also corrupt city council members, who are cheaper but also must vote a certain way. You can tell this guy is corrupt by, what, his inhaler? Play an election card and everybody gets to vote in a new governor and city council chairman, which means the winner gets to be this gentleman. I am quite certain that this is a developer's uncle, and they just used a family Christmas photo for it. The thing is, though, voting is pretty much worthless if you have two or less players. And if you don't have that, you might as well take these cards and just throw them away. Once the city phase begins, event cards are now also allowed to be played. This is where you can play disaster cards, making the mayor pay for them, make players pay taxes, discard all council members, and so on. Here's the issue I ran into with my first deck. It's super unbalanced. Of my 60 cards, only 18 can be played in the first settlement phase. I had 26 phase 3 city cards, only 11 Phase 2 Town cards, and only two Metropolis cards. One of them being a movie set, in which they somehow got a behind-the-scenes photo of John Travolta in the 1996 film Michael. Another problem was that in order to go from town to city in Phase 3, someone has to play a power plant card. Without that, too bad. And in all of my 60 cards, two of them were power plants. A coal one, 
and a hydroelectric one, which required to be built next to water. Thankfully, the manual does have a solution. You can substitute a power plant by using the back of the manual. Or, as stated on page 24, if you are having trouble advancing phases, acquiring a few boosters or a second starter deck should solve the problem. Otherwise, go f*** yourself. Really? I can make the game actually playable by just going out and buying more cards? As far as I can tell, cards don't have rarities. No commons or rares or mythics or legendaries or whatever. So there's no real excitement or hype over whatever new card I end up seeing. They're all about the same. All of the buildings are still about as generic as it comes, though it probably wasn't the wisest choice to include a colonial servants quarters. You may have noticed the unusually large size of these booster packs compared to conventional ones. That's because every pack also includes special long cards high-value cards that can only be built on top of two existing cards horizontally. Some are generic, like office buildings or a school. Some of these are notable landmarks. Why, yes, my city does have a Sequoia National Forest and the Panama Canal. F*** it, why not? Because they come in boosters only and stick out, every single one of these long cards I opened up were super bent to shit. Not that these have any value or anything, but like, come on, dude, at least protect it with some extra cardboard or something. Since the long cards can't be shuffled into the main deck, for obvious reasons, a separate long card deck can be used during play. Another issue I ran into with these long cards is, where am I supposed to put them? I can't fit them into a box with other cards, and no deck box exists that can comfortably fit everything. Also, there's no guidelines as to a reasonable size of the long deck. How many should I have there for smooth play? A few? A dozen? All of them? That goes for the rest of the deck, too. How many phase one, two, three, or four cards is expected? I'd imagine a higher amount of phase one and two, because otherwise the game can't even get going, and you spend most turns drawing and then discarding down to hand size. How could I fit enough of all of these in, while also including a healthy amount of event cards and nerds? Also, remember the mayor card? That isn't included in the actual deck. That must always be set aside, like a commander. There's also so much math involved. You'll need a score sheet for everyone's money, but there's also combo bonuses and multipliers that can happen, get bonus money for putting zones next to each other, and if a complex is built of interrelated cards of constituent zones, like farm, gambling, or post office, you cumulatively add in a bonus of that complex. Then if you rezone, upgrade, or rebuild, figure it all out again. All at the same time, keep constant track of the population. This is easier said than done when you play cards that say things like add one sim to every residential zone within three blocks, or whatever. Anytime you play another card that requires so many sims connected to it by transport, add it all up again, and oh, it's just always constantly changing. It's too much math. And this is coming from someone who regularly plays Magic the Gathering. I can't imagine this game was ever popular, yet it somehow managed multiple expansion sets, all based on real cities. Ultimately, the game just isn't very fun. It feels like it worked best as a three or more player game, but all the multiplayer stuff like console votes just seems tacked on. There's no voting in two player mode, making it very boring, and playing by yourself means there's no threat or challenge. You're just trying to get a high score or what have you. The cards all look pretty generic, and all the scorekeeping does get to be quite tedious. It straddles the fence of being a cooperative game and a competitive game too finely, making its purpose muddied and unclear on how it should be played. Despite being a collectible card game, nothing about it is collectible. It's too clunky, cumbersome, and uninteresting to retain anyone's attention, even if they're a fan of SimCity the video game like myself. It feels like a failed experiment. Like they said to themselves, how can we capitalize on the success of a niche genre while getting some of that sweet card money? It's a novelty, at best, and I don't foresee myself pulling this off the shelf to play at a party for people who even want to play. Unless I'm trying to make them leave. Now, I realize there's one final burning question on everyone's mind, and I am going to answer that right now.